I can see that Miss Sjensden, uh, and I hope I'm saying it close to the right pronunciation. <laughs> She's already there, so we, I'm going to give you the general <clears throat> introduction comments on this uh, panel. So, uh, first of all, I would like you to welcome I would like to welcome you all to the parallel section one of this uh, 2021 Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. It's a great honor to be here with you today. My name is Lucia Anjos. I'm from Brazil and I'll be moderating this two hour session. So during the first hour, we are going to be listening to four presentations of 10 minutes each. And I really ask the uh, people responsible for the presentation to stick to that limit of time. And uh, so we have some time at the end for question and answer sessions. If by any chance uh, there is a delay by the nine minutes of your intervention, I'm going to let you know that you have only one minute left. It is important. So we have at least 20 minutes or close to that at the end. And uh, after the first section, we are going to have a second one following the same format, the same procedure. There will be just a question and answer between those two sessions. And before starting, I ask you to check the Zoom chat as some additional rules and information on this session will be posted, mainly overall information, address, uh, uh, internet connect information, uh, information about the meeting itself. And please use the chat also to post your questions and include at the beginning of the question, the name of the presenter to whom a new question is addressed. We will choose a few questions to be answered live if we have time, and the rest will be answered via chat. So I also ask the participants presenting uh, their speech to pay attention to the chat and try to answer it in the same way. So without uh, further delay, I would like now to give the floor and uh, I still don't see Mr. Samuel. Please yes. go for Lucia, if I may, uh, it just wrote to me, he had issues in entering the, the meeting. I'm trying to liaise with him. Maybe you can swap with the second presentation while yeah. he joins. Yeah? So please uh, just tell him that we are going to do that. And that way we start the presentation with our second. Uh, that is about soil protozoa diversity at a coal post mining area at a different age of reclamation. So Ms. Tati Siansaden, you have the floor. Please open your presentation. Thank you. She may need some help with that, Isabella, because I didn't have time to prepare. Can you share your screen, please? Yes. We have uh, my presentation. Yes, just please okay. open it completely. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Can I start? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Lucia. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm Patti Suryati Samsudin. I will present our work in the whole uh, post mining area. So I'm from Indonesia and I come from Institute Technology Bandung, this is a university. And the study site is in another island that is in uh, Kalimantan or Borneo. And here is the study site. The study site uh, in is Kalimantan. In this area, we already have a, a post mining and the authority has already made a reclamation or revegetation. So 
uh, we know already that mining activity can interfere the soil structure and uh, function. Open cast mining method will change the soil surface and its environment. So the reclamation, so this is the process of the mining and then the reclamation process started with moving the overburden from the mining activity and reset the overburden uh, following the, count, uh, the contour and spread the soil, the top soil about 30 centimeter and this area is ready for revegetation. This is the worker starting by planting the, the local tree, uh, the fast growing tree. So this, this reclamation area, you can see, this is the mining area. And here is the uh, reclamation area. We can see different uh, performance of the forest or of the tree because they have different age uh, of the uh, revegetation. So we can find <clears throat> we can find the uh, area that already revegetated, already planting, and then uh, we can follow for different uh, age of vegetation. So <clears throat> the, the reclamation process in this area carried out in several stages. So that in the field, there are land with different ages of reclamation from one year to 16 years old. And uh, they are planting with Acacia mangyu, Paracientes falcataria, Samania saman, and also the local tree. There is Eudoxylon, Sorea, and Riobalanos. But in this study, uh, I will concentrate to the fast growing tree species. So, and the determination of study site based on the vegetation and the age of reclamation. So the objective of this study was to assess the diversity of soil protozoa in early period of reclamation at post for mining area. So we have uh, seven uh, area we compare between the area so, and we hope that with the age of reclamation, organic component in the area increase and the soil biotic component will increase, including protozoan community. So the methods so in this study, soil sample were collected from six different age of reclamation, sorry, uh, seven. At each site, soil sample was collected from uh, three different area with uh, uh, different tree and identification of soil protozoa was conducted following the references until morphous species level. Uh, here, some of the features, how to collect the sample, how to treat, and then we make, uh, we bring to the laboratory and make identification. For amoeba and test the amoeba, uh, we follow the, the, the reference from Smirnoff and Brown, and then from like, of flagellates, ciliates, we follow the, uh, the reference from other, and also we use other uh, references for identification like Lewis and Bamford, and uh, we have <clears throat> here the result of our study. We found four group of the protozoa, that is amoeba, Tested amoeba, flagellata, and ciliata. And for each group, we have different phylum. We have for amoeba, we have three different phylum that are combined with four different with different uh, number of species we found. And for testy amoeba, we found uh, seven species for amoebozoa. And then for cerozoa, we found five species. For flagellates, we found an Euglenozoa, we found seven species. For Cercozoa, we found two morphous species because we cannot uh, arrive to the species level. And then also for Quanozoa, we found only Salpinosa species. And for Ciliata, this is the most, uh, we found 13 species for Ciliopora. 
So for all of this, we found 40 spaces, 14 street morphosis species. Here are some examples of the protozoa that we found for, from the from the area, from post-mining area. This is the Arctino Gris, Petro Gris, Panela, so some of it of the uh, protozoa. And when we see the, the occurrence of protozoa at different area of trees and age of reclamation, here the blue is the, for the tree of replanted by uh, Paracelantus falcataria, and then the, the red one is uh, replanted with Acacia magnum. So we can see the, the, like the succession of protozoa community in different age of the reclamation. So this is the number of species we can find in each age. And we found that uh, the number of species of protozoa still increase in this area. And when we see for each group, it seems that the flagellates is the highest in all of the uh, different tree area and also in different age of reclamation. We can see that uh, the flagellate is the, the green one. We can see and then it is very interesting because for flagellate in Acacia magnum, this is the reclamation at five years old. And also we found in Samanias uh, other tree in Samanias Saman, that's the reclamation, the highest at the age of uh, five years old after uh, plantation. So this is very interesting because uh, this is, we can see the, what we call yeah, the colonizations of the protozoa mostly tend to increase. However, uh, we can see that the ciliates is uh, the, the lowest compared to other, uh, other group of the protozoa. And amoeba and teste amoeba, it's between the flagellate and uh, the ciliates. So for uh, in this research, so we conclude that after six years of reclamation, we found 43 species of protozoa. And in the fast growing tree, the number of protozoa, especially flagellate, tend to increase by the increasing of age reclamation. And the uh, Paracerantes facataria facilitated better than Acacia magnum and uh, Samania Saman on the developing of protozoa at mining area. I think that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your timing and presentation. And uh, if I think uh, Mr. Samuel is still not connected, so I'm gonna ask the next uh, presentee to go ahead and share with us the paper. So it's Miss Simona de Gregorio, and the paper is uh, Unexpected Microbial Functions in Agricultural Soil, Decontamination from PCB by SMS, Spent Mushroom Substrate. So please, Miss Simona, Miss Simona, you have the floor. Yes, Hello. I can see Thank your you. presentation. Thank you very much. Can you see my presentation? Yes, it's perfect. Just go ahead. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you. Good evening to everyone and, and to the University of Pisa in Italy. And my, uh, sorry, I should remove these. I don't know how, but in this way. No, sorry. Okay. Okay. So uh, the subject of my talk is the contamination by PCB in agricultural soil. We have some spots in Italy. And uh, it is important to say that actually the contamination by PCB in agricultural soil is quite low. It spans from two to 10 ppm, but the problem is very 
urgent and very important because of the extension of the contamination and also, of course, the, the, the matter that is contaminated. And it is mainly due, I think, mainly by um, the activity of some industrial sites and also dismissed to industrial sites, but the contamination is very persistent, so it's the has for decades. And for these reasons, um, during the last decades, um, most of the attention has been focused on the metabolic activity of fungi, and especially white dwarf fungi, but uh, because they are capable to produce uh, a battery of enzymes that are very specific towards very recalcitrant molecule, either the well, phenolic and non-phenolic moieties of lignin, as perhaps uh, all of you knows, and so they produce uh, polyphenol, polyphenol oxidases at high redox potential that can be exploited also for the transformation of PCBs in an oxidative environment instead of uh, the allogenation uh, in an aerobic environment. So they can be exploited for the treatment of soils. Um, the, the subject of our work was also the recovery of the wastes that derives from the production of the edible mushroom, the Pilotus ostreatus. And as you know, perhaps as you know, uh, for one kilos of mushrooms on the market, we have five kilos of spent mushroom substrates that is a waste and has to be disposed of. Actually, this uh, waste is in a way a resources because it's source of these kind of enzymes, the polyphenol oxidase is produced by fungi. And here you can see in this picture that uh, if, you, if you look at uh, which kind of enzymes that can produce either manganese peroxidase and lacases, but also versatile and lignin peroxidases, you know, at lowest uh, levels, but very, uh, very important enzymes because it's characterized by a very red, uh, high redox potential and that can be exploited also for the transformation of PCBs. Moreover, the spent mushroom substrates are also a source of um, inoculum in the matrices that uh, is amended with the substrates because they have a high load either of fungal load up to 10 to the 7, calling for units for gram of dry weights or bacterial load 10 to the 8 gram, um, calling for immunity per, per gram of dry weight of spent mushroom substrates. So what we did, we did a, uh, an experimentation at the pilot scale on this kind of pilots that is called the Ruanova. Uh, we can uh, uh, monitor and control many parameters and it is used to simulate processes like land farming or uh, biopile, but especially land farming. So the normal management of agricultural soils and we were dealing with a soil that was contaminated by 9.3 ppm of uh, PCBs. Uh, these are limits that we have to, uh, to, to reach in, uh, in Italy, at least for in the, in the introduction of the soils in a public area or in industrial area. And so we amended to the soil two uh, percentage of, of spent mushroom substrates. One is, was 0.1% uh, and one was 1%. The results obtained are very clear. We have no depletion of PCAs after 90 days of incubation in absence of the spent mushroom substrates. And here you see you can see the depletion of PCBs that is uh, quite uh, interesting. And in, if we amend 0.1% of SMS, it's even better if we amend 1% because the kinetic is uh, quicker, it's, uh, it's more favorable. And we have in 90 days, uh, more or less, the depletion of the, all the contamination. At the same time, you observe the humification of the organic matter because we have a significant uh, increment in the content of humic and fulvic acids in the soil. So we have a, a net, a real improvement of the quality of the soil that has been treated with the amendment of the spent mushroom substrates. And in relation to the, the contamination of the, all the containers of PCBs that were recovered in these soils, we had with 1% um, of amendment of spent mushroom substrates actually a quite complete depletion of all the isomers. Uh, but we, well, what we have done at that time was a lot of metabarcoding on the fungal specimen and on the bacterial specimen. So metabarcoding on the ITS for fungi and metabarcoding of 16S for bacteria. And what we found with a certain level of surprise that there was any significant change in the fungal ecology due to the process of PCB depletion. You can see from these three indexes of biodiversity, they are not changing either in the control or in the two treatment control, F1 or F7. So 0.1% or 1% of amendment of the SMS. While we have a significant changes in bacterial ecology during the process of depletion, here you can see that in the three different conditions, we have a sort of speciation of the bacterial community, a loss of biodiversity, and uh, um, a, a recover to, well, 
to higher value at successive time that is uh, uh, more uh, uh, accelerated in a way by the amendment of 1% of SMS because here we have a speciation that uh, takes over in 30 days instead of 60 and then we have a recovery to values of biodiversity or the, or the initial time of incubation. So there was a correlation be between the changes in the bacterial ecology and the process of TPCB uh, depletion. And actually this uh, um, correlation was confirmed by this kind of analysis where we can see that uh, uh, the um, amended soils with 0.1% or 1% of SMS were positively correlating with the humification, the increase in concentration of humic and fulvic acids and the depletion of PCBs in the soil. So the bacteria seems to participate to the process of PCB depletion in presence of, uh, of fungi that had been nucleated by the amendment of the SMS. To see, uh, well, to, realize, uh, to try to study, to, to have a look to what's, what's going on with the bacterial uh, functions in, the, in these processes, uh, we did a lot of predictive metagenomic functional profiling to quantify the contribution of different bacterial taxa to abundances of functional features that might be of interest in the processes. And actually we found that uh, the uh, bacteria that are um, characterizing these matrices has a functional uh, um, um, features that can be involved, of course, in the degradation of PCBs because they show uh, activity like the um, allogenated, uh, the transformation of allogenated compound comprising dioxins. And um, uh, in conjunction with other uh, capabilities that goes under the xenobiotic biodegradation and metabolism module of the, of the bacterial community. And also that uh, uh, the, these function, functional features are related to different bacterial taxa during the process. Here you see the, the, the times of incubation related to the initial time of the experimentation to the final time where we, have the, we, where we observe the PCB depletion. And here are the times of analysis that are related to the initiation of the process of PCB depletion. And you can see that uh, uh, every orange or yellow or even red uh, square, little square, is indicating an increment in the, in the counts for the functional features of that particular bacterial genus. And the, you can see that the bacterial genera that are involved in the three different phases are very diverse. Uh, so what we observed in, in parallel to a uh, decrease in biodiversity, we observed also a functional um, segregation of bacterial taxa that are participating to the PCB uh, depletion that is observed only in presence of 0.1% of 1% of spent mushroom substrates, while in the control we do not, have, do not assist to the speciation of the functional um, uh, moieties uh, mm, that are in, probably involved in PCB depletion. And what is quite interesting is that uh, um, the, uh, the phylum actinobacteria that is participating in the, in the process of, uh, in the in transitional times of analysis in the process of PCB depletion are harboring a uh, dye decolorizing peroxidase. So these are Polyphenol oxidases, bacterial polyphenol, polyphenol oxidases that are um, properties that are quite similar to the one of fungi that we mentioned before, so quite high red of potential, that is capable to transform either the phenolic or non-phenolic limine model compounds. Okay, so what happened when we look at the PCP depletion mediated by spent mushroom substances? We have a speciation of the bacterial community and the loss of some bacterial film. Um, that, of course, in all the uh, tests, uh, in all the experimental conditions that we tested, but only where we observed the, uh, the PCB depletion, we observed also the increasing or the, uh, the increase in the functional feature related to the actinobacteria that harbor the, uh, the IP, so the polyphenol oxidases. And only these, uh, if this um, increment is occurring, we have the blooming of bacteria that are putatively associated to the degradation of PCB that correlates positively with the depletion of PCB. But at the same time, the enzyme is not correlated to the depletion of the, uh, the contamination. Thus, uh, these enzymes uh, uh, seem to be associated more to the saprophytic metabolism of the phenobacteria than to the, deplet the depletion, the direct depletion or intervention of the contamination. 
And this is the production of these kind of enzymes by fungi or bacteria are related to their capability to participate to the carbon um, transformation in the soil that might be intended as carbon stabilization, but also has an activity that smoothly release carbon for the other uh, uh, bacteria in the environment. And in, in the case of an historical contamination by uh, recalcitrant, might be involved also in the mobilization of this ladder. And, creating the condition for the blooming of the specialist species that actually are might be directly involved in the mineralization of the contamination. So quickly to the conclusion, um, we thought that the uh, management of this kind of soils uh, and this kind of contamination really diffuse contamination at so low level might encourage the exploitation of the spent mushroom substrates not as a waste but as a resources. That's when we look at the uh, functional features that might be involved in a process of decontamination, we usually we look for specialist uh, spe specimens. So uh, microbial species that are involved in the mineralization of the contamination, but th that, that's, th that might be a little bit li limiting our perspe perspective. We should have a look to what is uh, defined as a generalist species that is involved actually in the carbon cycle and perhaps also in the mobilization of the contamination when it is uh, uh, actually not bioavailable and, and also for the reason really recalcitrant to biodegradation. That's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, well, we are going to proceed with the next presentation. And uh, so I invite uh, Ms. Maria Fernandez Bravo to present her paper, Diversity and uh, Abundance of uh, Entomopathogenic Fungi Metahesium SPP at High Sampling Resolution in uh, TIPIC uh, Swiss Permanent Grassland. So, Mrs. Maria, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Yes, thank you. So uh, um, I'm Maria Fernandez. I'm uh, actually involved in the molecular ecology group in Agroscope in Switzerland. Um, my main topic is focused on the entomopathogenic fungi and, and arthropod uh, soil communities. And, but today I will focus on only on the uh, um, entomopathogenic fungi. So. So entomopathogenic fungi are natural uh, regulators of arthropod communities, and also it has been discovered that they can also be antagonists of some plant pathogens. Uh, some of them have been associated with uh, uh, some plants, uh, has endophytes or working on the rhizosphere, and it has been the, discovered or described in more than 700 species, which are a great alternative to reduce the pesticide use and in fact, we can find now many products on the market uh, uh, developed with some of these entomopathogenic fungi species. But one of the most interesting groups is the genus Metarisium, which harbor around 30 species identified, uh, distributed worldwide. And in Switzerland, it's, it's one of the most abundant entomopathogenic fungi, and their main reservoir is the soil. Um, but uh, in previous studies, we were uh, analyzing the metaurisian uh, abundance and diversity in different land use types across uh, Switzerland. Uh, uh, we took three composite soil samples from 30 sites belonging to uh, uh, three land use types, arabalands, grasslands, and forest. Uh, these sites belong to the National Soil Monitoring Network. And then we analyzed the diversity and abundance and we did the, uh, discovered that there are uh, huge differences between the site of the three land use types, but not within uh, the, the land use types. For example, in grassland, that was the most abundant and diverse. Uh, we didn't detect strong differences between the sites. And then we were wondering if we increase the sampling resolution, we could detect more differences. And then it's because the objective of this uh, uh, work was investigate abundance, diversity, and population structure of metarisian species within increased sampling resolution in grassland soils. Also, to assess the spatial and temporal distribution of metarisian species and compare the accuracy of sampling density. For that, we select three permanent grassland plots in a radio within a radius of uh, 400 meters. 
uh, within each plot 10 by 10 meters, we divide it in 25 subplots and then we took a soil core in the center of each subplot. And then we repeated this sampling four times in a year in autumn, in spring, in early summer and late summer to uh, increase the spatial and temporal resolution of the sampling. And then in the lab, each sample soil was sheeted and homogenized and suspended in, a, in the still water and plated in um, a selective medium. To calculate the abundance per cream of soils, we count the colony forming units. And then some uh, colonies were selected and isolated for monospheric cultures. The DNA was extracted and then we uh, determined the diversity and population structure using 50 microsatellite markers. Also, we sequenced the elongation factor one alpha region to identify the species. And we use this information to analyze the population structure of metarising communities. So, and then as a result, we observed that the abundance of metarising was highest in the plot number one compared to the two and three in all the sampling times, but particularly the sampling time four was uh, the most uh, significantly abundant in all the plots. And if we go a little bit more in detail how the uh, fungus was distributed uh, across the plots and the sampling times, we observed a high spatial and temporal variability between the plots, uh, particularly between the plot number one and the two and three, and also a high uh, distribution in sampling time four, which suggests that the sampling time four, the late summer could be the best moment for the sampling in uh, Swiss grasslands. And then we were uh, wondering also um, if which could be the minimum number of samples to have a good representation of the abundance of metarism in, in each plot and sampling time. And for that, we calculate uh, in this graph, we can see for each plot and sampling time, we uh, calculate the differences between the plot sampling time mean abundance and the mean abundance is we take only one sample or two samples or three samples and so on. And then what we observe was for the sample for the plot number one and the sampling time one, uh, we have these uh, color lines to have like a, an, an arbitrary accuracy to reach the sampling. For, for example, if we want to obtain 500 colony forming units per gram of soil, it's the line green. For the plot number one and the sampling one, we have to take around 14 samples. But in the case of the plot number two and the sampling one, we only need six samples, which means that the sampling density accuracy differ among the plots and also across the time and it could also influence the outcome of the analysis. And then finally, uh, let's take a look at the diversity and population structure. From the 670, uh, 670 metarism isolates, we detected 22 genotypes belonging to three metarism species, uh, metarism robertsi, metarism brunion, and metarism gitsoense. And we observed uh, differences between the diversity of the three plots and also the four sampling times where one more time we observed a highest diversity in the sampling time four, which reforced the idea that the sampling time four is the best moment to sample in uh, Swiss grasslands. And finally, here in this unconstricted ordination, we represent this, the, the population, each dot represent the population of each sample for each plot and sampling time. And then with the permanent analysis, we observed that the plots significantly explain uh, more variation than sampling time among the uh, metarisum uh, populations. And then we can finally summarize that all grassland plots harbor a different metarisum abundance within plots, among plots, and across time. A high spatial and temporal uh, sampling resolution show with a high ab abundance, diversity, and population structure variability among grassland plots. Also, how we were uh, discussing before, the sampling time four seems this the best moment for uh, show uh, get the highest metarism abundance and diversity in all plots. And also the sampling density can influence the outcome analysis. So concluding, we can also say that in order to increase the biocontraputation efficient protocols are needed to monitor metarisium populations in the field. 
Uh, the late summer is the best sampling time to tame the biggest differences in abundance and diversity in Swiss crowds on sites. And um, uh, it is recommended to design specific sampling densities for each purpose due to the variability observed among the sites. But the methodology described here could help to easily calculate those sampling uh, densities adapted to each experiment. So I uh, would like to thanks to my uh, uh, research group, molecular ecology group, all my colleagues, my supervisors, and also the financial support for uh, belonging to Marie Curie Actions, and also thanks to you for your attention. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, the timing and all the presentations, also the beautiful images, those at the end, they are lovely. Thank, Thank you, you much. Well, uh, as I think we still did not hear from Mr. Samuel. So I'm going to start with uh, the question and answer presentation. And I'm going to ask Maria, please, to stop sharing. Thank you, Matt. Oh, Samuel is present. I'm ready. Good to see you guys. <laughs> I'm concerned. It so happens seeing you in my group, and then you don't show. <laughs> Okay, so without further delay, we are going to have the presentation from Dr. Samuel, uh, my colleague from the ITPS. Please, Samuel, you have the floor. Thank you. can see the presentation just says yes. Go ahead. Can, Thank you. You can see the presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I, I cannot connect in <laughs> with FAO system. Uh, thank you for your attention. My presentation is a comparative evaluation of bacterial biodiversity in rhizospheres of vegetative cover of exotic species of Australia, eucalyptus, and native tree uh, forest from Chile in cooperation with wetlands eroded uh, soil uh, of Chile. General work uh, is a uh, microbiological analyze of the evolution, biodiversity, and quantification of bacteria strain uh, are developed in the rhizosphere of eroded soil, exotic coverage like eucalyptus and native forest. Uh, we want to evaluate the effect of comprehensive soil restoration treatment through the application of soil and water conservation techniques. We want to evaluate also the microbiological properties of the biodiversity of bacteria in rhizospheres of vegetative cover of exotic and native species in eroded soils. Uh, this project is loca located in the semi-arid zone of the inland coastal uh, dryland of the Central Pacific Zone of Chile in the Maipo River Basin. Uh, our territory uh, are eroded soils. In this case, uh, we have a galley erosion. Like methodology, we, we take samples, we make a microbiological analyze, laboratory analyze, analysis with a software premium to uh, identify the similarity or biodiversity of uh, the bacteria. For example, this is our uh, 
survey, we have uh, area with gallery erosion. We have an area, uh, restored uh, area with uh, native forest and uh, with infiltration ditches. And also we have reforested area with eucalyptus camaldulensis with infiltration ditches and water micro reservoir, water reservoir. And you can see here the red eucalyptus from uh, Victoria uh, Lake, Australia, uh, eucalyptus camaldulensis. Uh, the result is the evolution of pilot area in the last three decades has been a process characteristic by uh, recovery in terms of vegetative biomass index and better uh, soil condition. We reducing soil loss erosion in the forested areas under soil conservation tree. The eucalyptus tamaldolensi, a tree uh, from Australia of Lake uh, Albacutia and Kiyai, Kiyaka Saponaria, is an endemic tree uh, of Chile, had evolved for thousands of years, adapting to various sound, climatic soil condition, and genetic memory, which has led to parallel evolution of the species of bacterial soil. K element for bacteria adaptation has been the raw exudate released by Kiyai, which allowed to establish that the rose exudate is different from the eucalyptus species because they belong to a different ecological and soil origin. According to the non-metric multidimensional scaling, the bacterial communities of the rhizosphere of eucalyptus and bar soils are significantly different. That means that depending bacteria proportion, depending of the vegetation code. We can also say that the sustainable management of soil after ecosystem approach have demonstrated high efficacy efficacy to recover degraded soil and ameliorate the soil of the biodiversity. In this context, they contribute to the recovery and recarbonization of eroded soil through the induction of potential recovery process and the generation of pedogenetic support and provision service in the interaction and synergy with soil biodiversity and soil conservation practice at the level of micro water we, we begin, we began to obtain a soil samples approach. Yeah. We had a low level of organic matter. pH is weakly acid, acid range, low electrical conductivity, low nitrogen, low uh, phosphorus, and, and high level of uh, potassium. Cation exchange capacity also is very low. In the evolution of the vegetation in the watershed pilot areas in the last two decades has been a process characterized by recovery in terms of vegetative biomass and soil condition. We reduce soil erosion and the soil conserving, conservation treatment. And also uh, biomass show a, a substantial increase in, in the watershed. According the non-metric 
multidimensional scaling of bacteria's community exhibit high similarity when they grow in the same environment. In this case, the bacterial communities of the rhizosphere of eucalyptus gigae and bar eroded soil are significantly different depending on vegetation cover. You have, he, you have here naked soil, you have here eucalyptus, and you have here gigae. All bacteria, group of bacteria from is depending of the cover vegetation. Uh, we have also uh, samples uh, to similar bacterial communities. On the, the, the nice samples have high biodiversity, which is visualized in the bifurcation of the tree dendrogram. Yeah. Uh, this is very interesting uh, to establish uh, the non-similarity in this case between the nuclide sequence of section is uh, acid uh, ribonucleic. At the beginning of the project, we have a uh, uh, a very high gully erosion. If we try with uh, boring control dams in granitic soil uh, to control uh, the erosion. In, at the second year, we make successive boring control dams with current stacks treatment to cover the gully erosion area. At the third year, we integrate treatment with acacia tree, grass species, and native forest, corn stake, and wooden control dam on its all uh, at the area covered be with uh, vegetation. Also, uh, after 15 years, we have controlled the gully erosion. Now we have a uh, kijai tree and acacias uh, wood also. And we, the soil carbonic uh, carbon are increment and also uh, soil biodiversity. The ecosystem now is in process of restoration to obtain soil service and uh, ameliorate the soil biodiversity. With native forests of Kiyai and Acacia like a site indicator. And also we are working now sorry, to integrate- Sorry, Samuel, but I'm gonna need you to speed up a little bit, sorry. Yeah, it's the last picture, the last slide. Thank you. Thank you. We have working now integrating soil restoration of the Cali erosion uh, to integrate many kind of uh, techniques. We have also developed a uh, erosion handbook of uh, control erosion with 25 techniques. The conclusion, the main conclusion, we don't have time, my conclusion is that the sustainable management of soil after ecosystem approach have demonstrated high efficacy to recover degraded soil and to ameliorate the soil biodiversity. In this context, they contribute to restoration and recarbonization of eroded soil through the induction of potential recovery process and the generation of pedokinetic support and provision service in the interaction and synergy with soil biodiversity and soil conservation practice at the level of watershed. On the last conclusion is in is the integration of uh, soil conservation technique and biodiversity 
with a ecosystem approach. Many thanks. Sorry with my delay. <laughs> That's okay. I just don't want to go too much on the next section. We have a few few minutes for questions. Um, for the first presenter, uh, if you look in the chat, they were both already answered. I'll just uh, comment briefly. So if anybody else is interested in the question and answer, they could also read in the chat. The questions would, were about the interaction of microfauna and protozoa, and also how close the protozoan community in the soils uh, on the reclamation to the original. So anybody else interested in those answers, you can read the chat because uh, Ms. Tati already answered it. I would like to ask a question, and uh, actually it's also in the chat, but I want to just point for you because I think it's in important. Contamination from PCB is still a major problem in many regions of the world. So I asked uh, Ms. Simana uh, how uh, she think that her results could contribute as indicators of strategies for the contamination of the sites. And uh, she also mentioned here a long answer in the chat, but I would like to just give you a few minutes if you want to add some comments on your answer. Simona Gregorio, Di Gregorio. And I would like to ask also Mr. Samuel to stop the sharing of its, the screen. Well, um... I think that we've diffused. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that with diffuse contamination, uh, the the only strategy that we, especially if they are related to contaminate to agricultural soils, I mean, only sustainability of the intervention can be adopted because of the extension of the contamination and also the problem of the low level of contamination. So there's no bioavailability of. Uh, of the contaminants actually so that that's one the main reason why they are not biodegraded actually so uh, the importance of this piece of work that we realize that uh, actually we are always looking for bacteria or microorganisms or fungi that are capable to mm, mineralize the contamination and this is very far from being reached and it's difficult to elicit or difficult to to take the condition to create a condition for well, uh, I, I would say that would be better to have a look to other class of microorganisms that are more related to the carbon cycles. That is the main factor at the base of the, of the resilience, but also the ecosystemic values of the soils. That might be actually the one that are involved in improving the viability in certain condition of historical contamination, uh, improve the viability of the contamination and create the condition for the blooming of the, the specialists that perhaps we are not able to, to increase in their activity with our intervention, but it's only the, the natural, sub, um, you know, uh, in the natural uh, installation of the function of uh, activities of interest of, in our processes, that is uh, mobilizing the carbon sources and then create the condition for specialists to bloom and to, to exploit their really, well, mm, the nature of their metabolic activity. And the spent mushroom substrate is only vehicle. Uh, many other wastes can be, uh, wastes uh, in brackets, they are resources that can be exploited for, for these this processes. Uh, thank you much for complementing that information. I have uh, one quick question for Ms. Maria Fernandez. Uh, if she could, uh, at her final conclusion, she was talking about protocols for monitoring the fungi meteorism. Uh, if she could just quick mention a little bit what would be her suggestion in terms of these protocols. And I'm going to also go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Samuel to read in the chat, there are some questions. One of them is uh, how sensitive are the primers that we use the, in a PCR? And uh, it's also mentioned 
uh, the question is because the presence of some inhibitors, for example, have metals. So I'm going to ask you, Dr. Samuel, if you could answer in the chat so we don't have all the delay, but uh, please address this. And Maria, back to you about uh, the protocols. Thank you. Okay. Shall I have to answer now or, or in uh, the chat? You could quick mention that. Well, what I suggest in my presentation for the monitoring was, for example, to um, uh, design specific um, protocols for the densities. So because have we have seen it's very variable. So and then it's needed to at the beginning, maybe like a pilot project to reach which number of samples could be the most interesting for your project and then start from this point. So if somebody else is more interested, maybe we can continue discussing in the chat or so. Thank you very much. So just uh, ending then this section, Dr. Samuel already answered one of the questions about the trees. I just want to point about uh, this first question that was way up. Uh, I'll just repeat quick if you want to mention it in the online. It's about uh, the primers that were used. If not, you can answer in the chat. And that way we could go to the next section. Samuel, it's uh, while I contact the other presenters in the second section, if you want to answer it quick, you have the floor. Yeah, um, we we begin to work with uh, uh, species like uh, acacias. Uh, acacias need uh, very very low nutrients and, and very low uh, water also. Uh, and later we begin to establish also gramineum. And in the series phase, we establish a native forest. But in this in this uh, consideration, we 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 make the forest uh, restoration together with soil and water conservation technique. At the beginning, it's, it's very important. The soil and water conservation uh, practice, and uh, we have to be to to begin with uh, species with uh, low uh, low demand of nutrients and low demand of, of water. Later we can, uh, for example, later we can. For example, we use uh, trees, but at first we have to to begin with soil and water conservation technique. Mm -hmm. uh, later, with uh, species like, uh, for example, acacias, acacias uh, tree had the properties to to fix it uh, nutrient. On, on had uh, many possible possibilities to obtain uh, a several kind of product for for the community. Uh, for in, in our country, it's, it's very important to to, to applicate uh, soil and water conservation technique, especially uh, for uh, conservation of, of the water. In the in the watershed, the, I will say the combination between vegetation, soil water conservation, and the participation of the people uh, in the project with a uh, ecosystem approach is very important to uh, recovery or for the restoration of a degraded art. Thank you. Uh, thank you much. Uh, thanks for all the, the presenters in this section. Uh, just to give a general explanation, 
we had a, a slight delay at the beginning between the general session and the beginning of this, which resulted in a delay of this section of about 15 minutes. So I'm sorry if that resulted in some problems for any of the participants trying to reach two different panels. So without uh, further delay, I would like them to give the floor to Mr. Alexander Crank for his presentation. Uh, and uh, it, the subject is assessment of agroecological conditions of terrain and soil cover using remote sensing data. So please, oh. Mr. Alexander. Hello, am I heard? You have the floor. You can share your presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, one second. Do you see it now? Yes, I can see it. Uh, just open entirely the screen, mm -hmm. please. Thank you. You mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Um, I'm working in the Institute of Geography uh, in Russia and uh, alongside uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a company which participates in uh, agricultural evaluation of, uh, of land. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, in our work, uh, we often uh, come to come to a situation when we need to do uh, a regional scale assessment uh, of agroecological conditions, uh, which are of course um, are connected with uh, with the soil biodiversity uh, and the general conditions uh, general condition of soil. Uh, uh, and most importantly, the condition of first uh, 30, 30, 30, 40 centimeters of, uh, of soil cover. Um, and so our goal was to uh, assess uh, the conditions partially uh, using uh, non-direct methods, uh, which mean uh, the age of um, <clears throat> remote, so, uh, remote, so, remote sensing instruments. Uh, and uh, often the task is required to be done over the uh, uh, big, uh, uh, big time series. Uh, well, because we need to estimate, uh, we, have, uh, we need to estimate the condition of, so, uh, of soils not uh, just in present, but uh, the dynamics uh, of, of soil condition uh, of what, uh, 10, 20 or, or more years. This is important, especially in uh, uh, countries uh, which uh, developed uh, after the end of the Soviet Union, because uh, they often uh, have very limited uh, amount of uh, soil data uh, and uh, very enclosed uh, or non-existent uh, non-existent uh, <coughs> data banks on soil conditions. Uh, and uh, several government structures and uh, commercial land users uh, are interested and uh, in reevaluation of uh, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so conditions uh, and specifically uh, with the ability to uh, make a um, backtrack of changes uh, over a decade or something. So, uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, our our group, uh, which were previously led by uh, uh, Professor Puzachenka, and now uh, we continue his uh, uh, to develop his ideas about uh, remote sensing. Um, 
Uh, we adopt uh, several uh, main strategies uh, in uh, uh, envisage of uh, of, this, uh, of such an instrument. Firstly, uh, it must be understood uh, that remote sensing is uh, a sensor which measures the uh, reflected solar radiation, and therefore uh, it uh, can be used to estimate the work uh, of the. Um, surface or so cover in our in our particular case as a dynamical uh, dynamical servo dynamical machine uh, and uh, it is absolutely paramount and in the case of um, uh, agro landscapes it's even most important to use a uh, uh, detailed time series of information because uh, the soil cover uh, 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 changes rapidly uh, under uh, under human activities, and uh, to stabilize uh, some conditions, uh, you must uh, you must uh, conduct uh, a very uh, um, a large amount of measurements uh, separated in time. Uh, uh, the methods, uh, the methods we used, uh, we can call a hierarchical factor analysis. Uh, the idea is such that uh, yes, the reflectance uh, of the soil cover differ greatly uh, over time. Uh, it is uh, uh, its different differentiation is based on uh, uh, local weather condition, uh, uh, some uh, condition of uh, agro uh, technology which is used uh, on spot and on time, and uh, the current. Uh, um, uh, cur uh, current uh, species which uh, which grown over the soil cover and so on. But uh, if you monitor uh, that uh, the landscape over uh, uh, sufficient uh, time series, for example, uh, three, four, five years, uh, you can uh, uh, derive from the large amount of large amount of data. Uh, a stable um, uh, stable factors uh, uh, using the dimensionality reduction procedure you can derive stable factors which are the part of information uh, which remain uh, uh, remain remain stable over time <clears throat> uh, and uh, we use a, a hierarchical model which uh, uh derive such factors uh from uh each of our time series for example time series uh within one year uh then uh we uh obtain stable conditions uh in all such factor groups uh uh integrate them together and uh from such an integrated uh data set we derive another uh, uh uh stable factor can uh, uh, another 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 stable factors uh, the uh, residuals information is considered uh, an, uh, a dynamic components and uh, the stable factors we call uh, invariance uh, oh, sorry yes <coughs> then uh, we can uh, classify uh, our stable con stable conditions and dynamic conditions uh, and uh, reveal the uh, we call it a, a stable course of such uh, of, of, of such classes uh, which uh, preside over uh, over, over the um, Changing conditions throughout the time series. Uh, such uh, course can be uh, physically interpret uh, uh, physically interpretable uh, through uh, remote sensing indexes uh, indices and uh, uh, through uh, 
relations with uh, uh, with the field data, uh, such as measurements of uh, basic nutrients uh, uh, or soil chemistry. Uh, when we uh, uh, going to uh, to the interpretation uh, of factor obtained uh, on this uh, on this uh, slide, uh, it is shown uh, the result of this technique applied to uh, region of uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, it's a Jazak region of Uzbekistan. Uh, we uh, throw, throw re relation with uh, uh, thematical data, uh, thematical field data like salinity, uh, mineralization of soils, uh, mm, uh, productiv pro productivity, uh, uh, productivity data. We can uh, rely our environments obtained through. Uh, previously discussed uh, dimensionality reduction procedures uh, with uh, semantic information. Mm. And uh, uh, while our, our environment, our environment uh, environments uh, were previously classified, uh, we can uh, est uh, estimate which class uh, uh, can be uh, given which um, agroecological uh, states. <coughs> uh, uh, on the screen, you see uh, uh, that we derive main uh, main factor for uh, this region is salinity, mineralization, and. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to need you to speed up a little bit. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I have. Okay. Uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, we uh, calculated the differences over time, uh, so, uh, se se uh, so several time series. As you can see on this image, uh, the, uh, uh, the system, uh, the water system of this region uh, is uh, 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 is, fun is function in such manner that uh, uh, it um, speed up the soil degradation from uh, uh, from north to south uh, due to the inclination of the relief. Uh, the derived classes are well separated uh, in time uh, uh, if we observe 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 them uh, through uh, dynamics of uh, spectral indices. As you can see, uh, the, the um, derived group uh, well saturated over the course of several years. And uh, um, uh, uh, they, uh, they, can be, uh, uh, they can be a good, uh, uh, there is a good machine. Uh, ma 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 there is a good machine learning uh, coincidence between uh, between groups uh, differentiated over time. Uh, so we can see that the most um, most of the land uh, are in a relatively stable condition, uh, while we can uh, uh, detect uh, uh, a dynamic, uh, dynamic a special dynamical elements. Uh, also, also, my um, report is not uh, entirely on uh, the matter of biodiversity. The shown uh, agroecological condition, which uh, also can be interpreted in other areas, are uh, obviously related, and uh, such instruments uh, can be coupled with. Uh, um, Biodivers uh, with uh, biodiversity field data, which can be also interpreted in, uh, in such manner over over large uh, over large period of times, for example, 20, uh, 20 30 years. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, uh, 
Okay, I, I, I said one phrase. And uh, if uh, anyone interest, uh, interested uh, in uh, uh, performing such analysis on their data regarding the biodiversity, I would be glad to hear it out and uh, my favorite copyright. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Thank you again. And I would like to then ask if you could stop sharing your screen. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to invite the, the next presentation. Uh, the next one is going to be Mrs. Antonietta Latessa, please. If you could start to share your presentation right away. Okay. Okay. Good. Good afternoon. Can you see the presentation? Yes, I just ask you to expand completely the screen since we're still in the Yes. Room. Okay. So, good afternoon yeah. to everyone uh, from Italy. My name is uh, Antonietta La Terza, and I am basically a protozoologist, even if I uh, currently use uh, also other uh, soil tax uh, uh, as indicator of soil health, such as uh, microarthropods. Today, I would like to provide you an overview of uh, the main outcomes uh, um, uh, in uh, obtained using affiliated protest as indicator of soil health in uh, different uh, uh, types of uh, agroecosystem uh, with different level of uh, soil disturbances. From this point of view, uh, I, mean, I would like to present the results obtained in the framework of three projects conducted in Italy. And the, the first two projects were realized in Mark region, where is based my university. And uh, the community structure of soil ciliates was, uh, I mean, uh, investigated just in uh, cropland and uh, arable lands and uh, natural sites uh, such as a forest. In the second uh, project, uh, the uh, ciliate community structure has been uh, investigated in vineyard. In the third case studies that I would like to present to you, the community structure of ciliate has been investigated in herbal land in the, the close adjacent um, to industrial site. So uh, just uh, analyzing different level of soil pollution. Here, just at a glance, uh, an example of the great morphological diversity of uh, affiliated protist. And uh, one aim of, uh, further aim of this presentation is uh, just to raise uh, awareness on uh, these uh, often <laughs> overlooked the component uh, of the soil biodiversity, so uh, the, which is uh, rarely used in the biomonitoring uh, uh, and uh, this uh, in spite of the fact that uh, ciliated protists uh, are play uh, key roles in the soil microbial loops and uh, uh, just uh, shaping uh, the bacterial biomass in the rhizosphere and those, uh, uh, I mean, uh, and those, uh, uh, they are deeply involved in the recycling of the nutrients and uh, uh, those they are able to promote soil fertility and productivity, that is uh, soil health. So, um, uh, the question that is uh, addressed by all the three project uh, case studies that I'm going to introduce uh, was to what extent and how do ciliate communities contribute uh, to soil bioindication. Here, a quick look uh, to the methodological approach. 
for the uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis of the community uh, structure from sample collection to sample processing. And regarding uh, the processing of the soil sample, they were uh, uh, treated using the no flute and the pet dish methods that uh, uh, imply simply uh, to wet the soil sample in order to favor the ciliate existment followed by the collection of the soil runon at the regular interval of time and uh, uh, the fixing, uh, the slide preparation, the uh, protocol staining, and in final, uh, the identification of uh, genus species level and the red counting on slide. So the aims of the first case studies was to evaluate the capacity of ciliate to discriminate between different land uses, forest and agrosystem cropland, I mean, in this case, but also to discriminate between different farming and management practices, in particular organic versus uh, conventional. Uh, here there is a map of uh, uh, the different uh, uh, invest, uh, of the 10 investigated sites, and uh, um, uh, the dark green dot uh, highlights the forest site and, and disturb the soil. The light green dot represents the organic farm with minimum tillage, and the yellow dot just shows the conventional farm with soft seeding and chemical weed control, that means uh, uh, glyphosate. Uh, soil sample were collected twice uh, in spring and autumn, and the next slide show substantially uh, the results that were obtained uh, in this project. As you can see, uh, the different land uses uh, uh, host different ciliate protist community. We can see a separation between uh, the uh, forest, uh, the forest uh, system with respect uh, to the cropland, and also we can see how the organic farm are very well separated, uh, separated from the conventional, uh, the conventional farm. This uh, result was also supported by another analysis, the indicator species analysis, that showed that each of the explored sites are also characterized by different set of indicator uh, species. Here you can see the top scored ciliate species uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, with respect to the three investigated sites. Uh, moving from cropland to vineyards, the aims of the second um, project was to assess the long-term effect of organic floor management on soil health. And uh, in uh, a commercial vineyard that was located in the uh, terroir of the Verdicchio Matelica, which is a quite worldwide, uh, worldwide famous wine, and in this commercial vineyard, we uh, selected uh, three uh, vineyards of different age that were organically managed um, at the time of sampling uh, for uh, 19 years. So this was uh, the oldest vineyard, 13 years, and in final, the youngest vineyard for uh, two years. With respect to the soil floor management, this is quite common in this area. It just imply uh, the uh, tillage, tillage and no tillage of the inter row with annual cover crops. Uh, ciliates, uh, soil sample for ciliate investigation were collected uh, in both the no tillage and tillage inter row. The slide just uh, show the result, and, and uh, uh, you can appreciate that the oldest vineyards uh, just uh, host more stable uh, ciliate community. As you can see in the uh, three diff different sampling events, uh, the uh, oldest vineyard, the ciliate community in the oldest vineyard, experience less fluctuation uh, in terms of uh, uh, 
species and, uh, and uh, abundances. Uh, and this is different from what was recorded for uh, the youngest vineyard, in which, as you can see, there is a large fluctuation of the uh, ciliate community across the three independent events. So uh, this effect may be due to the greater soil resilience, possible as seeded during the long-term organic management of the vineyard. And uh, I mean, a similar result was also obtained using a uh, different uh, soil bioindicator, microarthropod communities. And so for those that could be eventually interested in this other part of the work, can have a look uh, to the poster session uh, with the, the poster of Dr. Aldo D'Alessandro. And final, uh, the third case studies, uh, the uh, main aims was to evaluate the potential of soil ciliate communities to discriminate between different levels of soil contamination in four industrial areas. And as you can see, I have organized, I mean, all the, um, the sites, industrial sites, according to a decreasing level of uh, soil contamination. From this point of view, the most polluted site was Brescia Caffaro. And as you can see here, there is a, a long and uh, I mean, uh, uh, list of uh, inorganic and organic pollutants uh, that uh, I mean, widely exceed uh, the allowed uh, legal limits. In the second position, uh, there is Ital Cementi from Cement, uh, Cement Factory. And then uh, the latter two. Uh, uh, industrial sites were less contaminated or not contaminated at all. The slide is shown here and uh, is a uh, generalized the percussive analysis, which I just used all the data uh, from uh, uh, contaminants, uh, chemical and physical factor. This means uh, agronomic factor, means uh, uh, pH, uh, texture, um, uh, macro and micronutrient, and obviously uh, the biological data matrix is uh, about ciliate. And what we can appreciate here is that uh, uh, the most polluted sites are uh, different, um, I mean, are um, uh, separated each other, but also are separated for, from the less polluted sites. Uh, to summing up all the results and just to recall the question that I just uh, posed at the beginning, so to what extent and how do um, the ciliate uh, community contribute to soil bioindication, we can say that according to the first uh, case studies, uh, ciliate community contribute uh, discriminating between natural forest and uh, natural and agroecosystem, as well as discriminating between different management system, providing a specific land use set of indicator species. And in the second case studies, uh, 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 acting as a proxy of soil resilience in agroecosystem and thus as an indicator of a sustainable land management. And in final, the third case study is discriminating between different levels of soil contamination in polluted sites. Overall, these outcomes add new knowledge towards a more informed use of ciliate as a bioindicator of soil health and broaden, broaden our understanding on how land use intensity, agricultural management, and contamination level can shape ciliate protest uh, communities. As we learn from uh, uh, the beginning session, uh, 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 protests are uh, groups that are missing and, uh, and are, in general, over under studies. In final, uh, just this is the last uh, slide. Uh, uh, these types of analysis allow us to investigate in greater details soil diversity and just allow us to discover several different uh, new species for the science. A great thanks uh, to all of you uh, for the attention. Thank you, Matt. I'd like then to, without further delay, to invite uh, Mrs. Maria Chia Chiara mm -hmm. for her Allora. presentation. And I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Antonia to stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Matt.
Here I am. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. And can you see my screen? Perfect. Start okay. the already. Okay, great. So good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're connected from. Uh, so indeed, my name is uh, Maria Chiara Rosace, and uh, I am uh, at the moment working for Horta, which is a spin-off from the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore of Piacenza in Italy. Uh, but this work was actually done during my Master of Research at Harper Adams University and uh, was part of AgroCycle, which was uh, an Horizon 2020 project uh, addressing the recycling and valorization of waste coming from the agri-food sector. So let's get immediately started. Okay, so during the last few days of the symposium, we heard many times uh, about soil quality, so you all know what I'm talking about. And soil quality is determined by the physical, chemical, and biological components of the soil. I would like to spend a couple of words on the use of biological indicators in particular. Biological processes are intimately linked with the maintenance of soil structure and fertility, and are potentially more sensitive to changes into soil than indicators based on physical or chemical soil properties. Biological indicators may provide early warnings of system collapse and allow us to react before uh, irreversible damage occur. That said, let's remember that this work was performed in the context of agrocycle. So from an agricultural perspective, in order to conserve and enhance soil health, it is often necessary to use organic amendments to support uh, soil organic matter production. And, uh, for example, through the use of uh, uh, organic fertilizers. So digestate derived from farm and agroindustrial residues can be used as fertilizers in agricultural fields. The effects uh, of, um, on soil of different digestates uh, have been used in terms of physical and chemical impacts mainly, but their effect to soil biological properties and particularly on soil biodiversity are not well understood. Okay, so I move to the next slide. Okay, so the aim of our study was to investigate the impacts of digestate on soil microarthropods communities uh, as quantified by the Soil Biological Quality Index and the Solvita soil respiration tests. And uh, one uh, of our main aim was also to compare these different two metrics that are used to evaluate soil health, because we were interested in seeing how the effect of digestate would have been reflected by the two different soil health metrics. Okay, so I show you the methods uh, uh, of our uh, of our project. Uh, so we collected soil samples from uh, an already established field experiment that was located in the in the South UK, and the field uh, had a previous history of amendments. Uh, particularly, uh, it was treated with compost, chicken manure, and parmesan manure, and some plots were of course left untreated and uh, in 2018 uh, the digestate was applied in half of the plots and so we collected the soil samples soon after the digestate application in order to apply the soil biological quality index and the solvita soil respiration test so if you had a chance to follow yesterday professor christina menta presentation you probably know about uh, the qbs but uh, i will tell you briefly what i'm talking about uh, so QBS is an index that is based on the concept that the greater is the degree of adaptation to soil of an organism, the lower is its ability to leave the soil under unfavorable condition. So basically, the more an organism is adapted to live in the soil, the more vulnerable it is which means that the presence or absence of the most adapted organs is a good indication of the level of soil disturbance. And another interesting thing about QBS is that it is not based on difficult taxonomic classification, but you basically classify the organisms depending on their biological form. So here there is an interesting, uh, some interesting pictures about springtails. So for example, imagine I'm asking you, which is the, between these springtails, the one that is most adapted to live in the soil. I think all of you could easily reply, 
why? Because, for example, let's have a look to the one that is showed in the left side of my slide. So it is very dark. It has long appendixes. It has long legs, long antennas. Why do you need these uh, uh, appendixes? When, when you live above ground, because you need to walk, you need eyes to see, you need an, a dark skin because you need to be protected from the solar radiation. While moving to the left, the organs are more and more adapted to live below ground. So there is no color anymore, the appendixes are shorter. So basically, you can classify the organisms like this. And um, of course, the springtails on the left side will have a higher score and will, will contribute on a higher level to the QBS final score. Okay, uh, the Solvita instead, which is the second matrix that we used, is uh, a commercial test that measures soil health. How? Measuring basically the carbon dioxide flu flux from the soil after rewetting the soil samples. And there is um, a, a kit that can be used for the Solvita. And uh, basically, you use a digital color reader uh, to uh, measure the carbon dioxide that has been respired uh, in the soil. So quite easy to apply. Um, soil respiration rate can be influenced by a wide range of parameters, uh, including temperature, humidity, uh, incubation conditions. Uh, and uh, uh, we can also consider that uh, there are in the, in the soil, there can be organisms respiring that are not good. There can be pathogenic organisms respiring in the soil. So we, we were considering all of these you know, parameters when applying uh, uh, and when comparing the two metrics. Let's have a look at the results that we obtained. So these bars that I'm showing you in this slide show the QBS result. And it is very clear that the plots that were amended with the digestate, despite the previous amendment, so despite the farming manure application, chicken manure application, or the others, had higher soil biological quality index scores. I show you now the results that we obtained with the Sol Vita soil respiration tests. And that they look very different from those that we obtained with the QBS. So it seems that there is uh, that there are no major differences between the different plots and between the different treatments, and most of all between the digestate amendment plots and the control. So what's the answer? Does the digestate really increase soil health or not? We correlated our uh, uh, metrics, um, so the QBS and the Solvita results, uh, and uh, as you can expect from the bars that I showed you before, uh, the correlation was very, very low. The Solvita was uh, showing no significant differences between digestate application and control, while the QBS showed higher values in digestate amended plots. And um, in our opinion, has uh, uh, we considered the, all the parameters that uh, I mentioned before, uh, and as the respiration rate can be influenced by a wide range of these parameters, it was unclear to us if Solvita was robust enough to effectively quantify soil health. So the Soil Biological Quality Index uh, is an easily applicable index, uh, and uh, it has been uh, widely used uh, in the literature by several authors. Uh, and uh, it seems actually that digestate application can have a positive impact on the biological communities. So why? Because maybe it increases organic matter, it can provide substrate for the organisms to heat, and it can also increase the moisture in the soil. And it has been proved that soil uh, with higher moisture levels uh, have, are more suitable for organisms to live in. While on the other end with the Solvita, we found uh, uh, not such a result. And uh, so um, we need to consider that conclusions uh, can be method dependent, uh, meaning that when we choose a method to evaluate soil health, we need to be careful in selecting the method and maybe use different, different indicators in order to, to conclude correctly uh, on the real state of soil, uh, of soil health. And I thank you very much for listening. And I would like to point your attention once again uh, on uh, the beautiful uh, uh, the beautiful sentence that we used the last year from FAO, keep soil alive, protect soil biodiversity. And if you have any question, feel free to contact me as this presentation was quite, quite slow. So thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks for your timing and your presentation. So I'd like to invite to the floor our last presentation of this session. 
I Mr. Alan, Alan Belmont, please correct me. Probably I said your name wrong. So yes, this is Alan Brahman, Yeah. Thank you very much. You have the floor. And Sorry. My ears is stop uh, yes, I'm okay. Wait. Thank is you. Is it Mary. okay, everybody? Yes. Okay. So. Um, okay. So first, yes, I will begin by the first one. So thank you for inviting me to uh, provide my uh, result on biofunk tools. So I am Alain Bromine, a soil ecologist, and I belong to IRD, a French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development. And today um, I will uh, present a biofunk tool, which is a multifunctional approach of soil health related to soil biota activity. And you see that uh, this multifunctional approach is interesting compared to just the Solvita one. And um, so I present this work with Alexis Tomaso from CIRAD because he is a co-conceptor of Biofunk tool. And uh, we uh, use this tool with a lot of partners in uh, Thailand and uh, Ivory Coast in other countries. So it's a really a partnership uh, uh, construction. So, uh, as you may know, uh, soil health is defined by the ability of the soil to function as a living ecosystem. But the problem is when you want to monitor soil health, what kind of function you will, you will uh, monitor, you will assay. So Kibble White in a seminal paper in 2008 uh, made this the following assessment that, um, you, you, that agriculture for agriculture, we need to focus on four major functions, carbon transformation, nutrient cycling, soil structure, and regulation of pests and disease. And each function relies to the biota assemblage to soil biodiversity. Yeah? Soil structure is an habitat for the biodiversity, carbon transformation is the energy for the soil biota, nutrient cycling is a result of the activity of the soil biota. So, but we have, um, if you go to the to the literature, we have a, a, a little problem with the soil health assessment. No, because soil health is considering as a sum of independent properties. So you had physical, chemical, biological property. You sum it, and more you have, better you get. So this is not for us a real assumption of soil health. And so our suggestion proposition is instead of having this reductionic approach based on the assessment of independent properties, we suggest to have a more dynamic integrative approach based on the assessment of function. Function result of interaction. This is, uh, I've been nicely provided by uh, my, uh, the talk before me. So for example, soil respiration is due to the fact that biomass, the microbial biomass is in interaction with the edaphic component of the soil. So this vision is based on three main components. First, the non-manager are the main actors. So if you want to select tools, they, they must be easy to use tools because non-managers should be able to evaluate by themselves the efficiency of their practice. So biodiversity, and this is why we are in this Congress, as you may know, or as a main driver of soil functioning. So I will not go into detail on that. Everybody knows that now. And an important issue too, is to provide the scoring an easy way to score the method, to score the data we have in order to be easily understandable by the non-manager. And so we provide this scoring method based on the three main functions, structural maintenance, nutrient cycling, and carbon transformation. And so this is biofunk tool. So we have a set of nine indicators. Each indicator is linked to a defined function. For example, for structure maintenance, we have three uh, indicators. For carbon transformation, we have four. And for nutrient cycling, we have three. So how we select these indicators? All the indicators we select on the basis that they are low tech and cost effective. Why? Because we want to transfer it to land manager, especially in developing country where we work. There must be infield indicators. It's not because we love field by itself. It's because we want to be more linked to the reality of the function. If you take a soil, you sieve it, you dry it, and you send it to the lab, you will not really respect the physical integrity of the soil. So this is why all the measurements are done 
in the field. And they also provide immediate results in the field. So that's a good way to interact with the land manager too. So uh, Biofunk tool was um, validated. We have more than six papers now in the different kind of uh, pedoclimatic condition with different actors, NGO or technical institutes and different agriculture practice from agroforestry to annual crop or um, agroecological, like agroforestry site. So just, um, <laughs> I will give you two example. This first, if you want, here we compare two kinds of uh, practice, conservation agriculture compared to conventional tillage. And you see that whatever the site, Cambodia and New Caledonia, which are completely different in terms of pedoclimatic conditions, we show that conservation agriculture practice deeply improves soil health. And you can see easily too here that you can monitor each, the score of each function. For example, if you compare here, you have more nutrient cycling, uh, excuse me, here than here. So if you want to store carbon, you will perhaps choose this monoculture. This is associate culture. So, Another issue concerning the agroecological transition is to monitor soil health over time. So here, for example, this is a work we have done in Ivory Coast that uh, after logging, this was a main disturbance, tree logging, we monitor the evolution of soil health in different treatments. So the treatments here uh, is, um, are linked to the adding of soil organic matter residue. And what we see here is after six months, we don't see any difference after logging, but after 18 months, we do see that the adding of soil uh, organic matter increase soil health uh, quality. Oh, excuse me, soil health, um, soil quality index, exactly. So, we claim that uh, biofoam tool is linked to soil biodiversity. In the same experiment, we monitor soil, bio, soil fauna biodiversity and soil functioning using biofoam tool before at T0, before tree logging, at, at T6, after six months after, after tree logging and 12 months after tree logging. And if we do a statistical analysis, this is uh, what we call a correlation. We, we, we can see um, here, it is a co-inertia analysis, sorry. So we can see, see that there is a good overlap between macrofauna biodiversity and biofunct tool analysis. So soil function reflect here the evolution of soil biodiversity, but as the advantage of biofunct tools that you don't need so much expertise to monitor soil function. If you want to monitor soil macrofauna biodiversity, you need a good expertise. So what, what is our, I, I try to respect the time, so I think um, I have some time now. It's biofront to provide to be sensitive to, vari to various agricultural practice. And this is what I showed you before. And so it's a good way to accompany land manager to adopt management practice that really improves soil health. And perhaps the most important thing for us is uh, to, be, to, to be able to strengthen the capacity and autonomy of land manager to monitor by themselves their, their, their soil health. This is not exactly, uh, we are not at this stage now, but this is exactly the objective for Biofunk tool. Thank you for your attention. And um, I will be really pleased to uh, answer all the questions you have. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Your time was valuable, precious and perfect for us. Uh, we did have some questions for the previous presentees and some of them were already answered uh, in the chat, but um, <clears throat> since yours was the, the last presentation, I still want to add at least one of them. And uh, I will select here the, the question from Mrs. Lydia Nicola. She poses a very interesting one. How does Biofunk2 actually work? And what do you do in the field? 
and since there is a second person and third one, so if you could just use a few minutes for that, I would appreciate. It. Thank you. Dr. Yes, it's a, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's, I, I don't know if I have the time really to describe how I use biofunct tool on the field because I, I use nine parameters, not nine tools. So uh, I, I will not have the time to describe all the tools. So perhaps I can send all the basic papers describing how we use it. Um, the thing is, uh, it's a really simple tool. For example, I will take one or two we use for soil respiration. For example, we don't use Solvita, we use another one. But what we do, we measure carbon labile and we do, and in fact, the respiration we have, we will um, uh, take it uh, in correspondence with the soil carbon available. That's like that, perhaps you will not have the, the problem you, you, you saw Maya perhaps with Solvita because this respiration is really linked to the carbon content of the soil. So by that, what I want just to highlight the fact that one indicator is not really a good way to measure soil health. You need to measure soil health using different kind of indicators and after you can really rely them between them. And I think this is, I don't know if I really answer the question, I'm sorry for that, but uh, I will really be pleased to send uh, uh, the methodology of Biofunk tool to anyone who wants it. Yes, uh, I think indeed it would be just uh, another presentation to be able to answer those in details. So if you could please add to the chat now to everybody uh, how to contact and how to get more information, some basic papers, that would be very interesting for everybody. Okay, I will, I, I will try my best. Perhaps right. my colleague to uh, Alexi Tumazo perhaps can send to her. Thank you much. Uh, so finally, we are at the end of the presentation, so of the session. I'd like to thank you again, uh, all the, the invited presenters for the magnificent works. We had a variety of materials, very interesting here, since uh, biological assessment, which is so much needed nowadays, since uh, we have like a protocol for voluntary guideline for soil management. And one of the main questions last year in the plenary assembly was in the aspects of uh, biodiversity, how to measure biodiversity and how to use the concepts in these voluntary guidelines. So I presume that after the end of this meeting, we are going to have some very good ideas to ask that questions and to increase some info, uh, add some information in that protocol. So I'd like to uh, express also <clears throat> thanks to all the, the people that are helping in the background, the FAO uh, personnel and Isabel for all the support. And thanks a lot for all the 170 participants that are still here with us. Uh, I suggest all of you check in the chat. You can copy it because there is nice information being presented and posted by everybody that was here with us today. My last question is going to be for the presenters because I know that may be important for you if you want to all open the, the camera, so that way you can highlight yourselves and make a picture for your records of this meeting. I think it would be interesting for yourselves. So we have uh, some of the presenters here. It would be nice to have a first screen with pictures and people. That way, each one of you can save that as a memory. So just three more to go. Mr. Alexander, if you could open your camera, then we have all the presentees. Thanks a lot, Isabel. Maybe she's busy already with something else. But anyway, thanks a lot. It's a beautiful image to see and thanks a lot and continue with our next sections tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank yes. you, Ciao.